Welcome to the Manga and Libraries webinar series. Tonight's topic is Manga and Libraries BIPOC representation. Experts will discuss the importance of BIPOC representation in manga, BIPOC artists and authors, celebrating identity in libraries, book recommendations, and more. These webinars are sponsored by the New York City School Librarians Association and the American Library Association's Graphic Novels and Comics Roundtable. You can visit mangaandlibraries.com to watch past webinars and to get information about upcoming webinars. I'm Jillian Rudis, the school librarian for a sixth through 12th grade public school in New York City and the Japanese culture and manga special collections librarian for the New York City Department of Education. Hi, I'm Cesar Ortega. I am the teen librarian for the Aurora Public Library uh, District West Branch. Um, I am just an avid reader and collector of manga, uh, and I'm blessed to have the chance to be on this panel. Thank you. Hi, I am David Brothers, and I love Otis Redding sitting by the dock of the bay so much that I moved from Georgia to Oakland, where I edit comic books and Japanese manga, and also do a little bit of comics criticism and that kind of thing. And I'm really happy to be here as well. Hi, my name is Reedy. And I'm a content acquisition librarian at a Crown Corporation in Canada and cancer researcher at South Lake Medical Center. Um, because I do not serve a population where I can acquire manga, this is coming from a vested uh, personal interest. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Karina Gilandan. I'm a middle school library media specialist from the Rio Grande Valley, Texas, which is on the Mexico Texas border. I currently sit on the Texas Maverick Graphic Novel Reading List Committee for the Texas Library Association, and I was an Excellence in Graphic Literature Awards juror last year. So I'm excited to be here and talk Ninga. Um, hi, <laughs> I'm Yasa. Um, I'm 26 years old and uh, I'm a college student at the moment. I will start university next year. Um, and uh, I just passed my entrance exam. So uh, January 2023, I will be a game designer and media assistant in training. Um, I was invited here because uh, I am actually a mangaka myself and I have a manga coming out in the first quarter of 2022 with the publisher Concept Moon, which is a publisher uh, that only hosts like uh, POC and Black artists, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, you can find us on Twitter, like at Concept Moon. Uh, we have serializations and you can read our manga online too. And yeah, I'm really happy to be here. That's why I was approached, I think, because one of my like um, OC sheets like went kind of viral. And then uh, a friend of Jillian like Damien, I was so happy because I never did this before. So I'm really glad to be here. Hi everyone, my apologies. My Wi-Fi is absolutely terrible right now due to the storm. Uh, my name is Renee Scott. I am a young adult librarian for the New York Public Library. I am a self-professed long, lifelong otaku and cosplayer. And since February, I am also a contributing blogger for Good Comics for Kids, which is a blog for School Library Journal. Awesome, yay, I'm glad we're all here and I'm frozen now. <laughs> um, so tonight's panel will actually be moderated by Reedy and myself, and all the questions were collaboratively written by all panelists. So Reedy, let's get started. Thank you, Jillian. Before we begin, I would like to take the time for a land acknowledgement. I am streaming today from the occupied lands of Mississauga, Miami, and Peoria, as covered by Treaty Number no. Two, signed by the Crown and various war chiefs of the First Nations in 1790. By acknowledging this land is to acknowledge that the truth is at the forefront of this conversation. As a settler who had the opportunity to be educated on indigenous territories and lands, I recognize my privilege and I am committing to acknowledging indigenous issues in an ongoing manner. I want to take this as an opportunity to foreground our political commitment to justice, preservation, and assert the sovereignty of these nations on their lands. From that commitment, I draw power and I hope that my sharing today will do the same for you. With this, I will now frame our topic of conversation today. 
Manga has had a history of stereotypes and representation that we here fully acknowledge. However, in the interest of this webinar topic, we are discussing future representation and where to go from there. So my first question is, what has been your personal relationship with representation in manga? Why is it important that readers see themselves and their stories represented in manga? Uh, I can jump in if that's okay. So I'm David and I am 38 years old. So I was a kid when Akira and Fist of the North Star were coming out in America for the first time. So I was like perfectly primed for that to be the coolest thing in the world. And so Japanese manga as well also was the coolest thing in the world because it was new, it was fresh, it was a perspective I hadn't seen before. And there weren't a lot of Black people in manga for the most part, but there were characters, you know, that we adopted. We joke like Piccolo from Dragon Ball Z is Black for a variety of reasons too deep to go into here. But it's sort of the same thing as I got from Western cartoons where I kind of had to find someone to latch on to that I identified with rather than having like a direct like, oh, this guy is the black guy. He's who I'm going to, you know, he's there for me or something like that. It was sort of a little more nuanced than that, I believe. Uh, I can go next. Um, I'm Caesar. Uh, I'm 20. I'm going to be 28 years old. And I got into anime and manga around the time of like Toonami being a big thing. Um, like leading up to like uh, Adult Swim. And I first saw uh, my first character of like Mexican descent in uh, Chad uh, from Bleach. And I remember uh, we, they, they were having a fight and he pulls out this cool arm that he calls uh, El Brazo del Derecho del Gigante. And I was like, whoa, he just spoke Spanish? Like what's going on here? And I went online and I was like, oh, he actually has he is from Mexican descent and he has an abuelo that he he went and visited in Mexico and everything and that was huge for me um I look nothing like him because he's like a nine foot tall giant uh and I am very very short but I was still like but they spoke Spanish and that was incredible uh and being able to go back now that I'm older and see like oh look there was also representation in like Captain Tsubasa uh and um other shows and it's very very interesting to see, uh, so you love to see it. I just want to chime in because Cesar, um, I'm also at a Mexican descent. So I was actually going to mention Chad, right? Because he, I think according to the manga, he was uh, born in Okinawa, but then he grew up in Mexico, right? So seeing that as a uh, Hispanic is amazing because I finally see myself in a book. However, I'm five feet. <laughs> and I'm um, a woman, so maybe not 100% spot on on the representation there, but growing up, my, I mean, what, what girl didn't like Sailor Moon at the time, right, in the 90s, um, <laughs> yeah, however, even as a kid, I thought, you know, I would love to see myself as a hero, and I think with our kids, especially my students in middle school, they want to see themselves as the hero and not just the villain or some sort of caricature or some sort of villain that the media portrays us to be. And um, anything that we can see in manga, whether it's Luffy from One Piece or uh, Rosarita Cisneros from Black Lagoon, um, representation shouldn't just be like an artistic or literary inclusion, but recognizing that our identities are validated and that our experiences and our stories are authentic, which otherwise, you know, maybe wouldn't be said or voiced. So um, as far as my personal relationship with representation, I think I'm still on that journey. I know that I don't see myself often in manga, even in anime. So, I mean, as far as, you know, to not include um, people of color or at least try to move toward more inclusive storylines um, gives people the message and kids the message that our stories don't matter and that we're not included in this global dialogue and makes it easier for people to erase our identities and voices. And then people wonder later, you know, where are we when we have to speak up about certain injustices and where are we? Well, we're right here, but nobody's telling that story. So hopefully we move toward, toward more inclusion. Same. Um, when I started, it was more seeing, you rarely saw Black women 
an anime unless it was a black exploitation version. So it's like, okay, we're seeing an anime version of Pam Grier. But in a way, we're still seeing them not weak, but they're strong. And my my exposure was Claudia from Robotech or Macross. And she was a commander. And she wasn't stereotyped. And she did have a beautiful story. But it was like, it was very rare. And even in the, I grew up with Dragon Ball. I have a love-hate relationship with it because of Mr. Popo. So as much as like, yeah, we like that story, but you need to go. Um, but just seeing it. Uh, can I can I say something for a second? I'm I'm so sorry. Um, because you mentioned Dragon Ball. Um, we were literally just laughing about that a couple of days ago on Twitter. It's like the OG Dragon Ball. Like maybe you remember, mm-hmm. uh, when Goku and Piccolo fight. It's like streamed on national TV, and um, I was so shocked. There's this black guy with like a um, Tarzan like a uh, lion clove like in the tree with a rice cooker and a tv and that was so racist and i was so shocked when i saw that as a kid because like i'm i'm partially like i'm mixed i'm half black and i was so shocked because i was like oh my god what the hell <laughs> i just wanted to bring it up it was terrible i'm <laughs> sorry you can continue it's okay <laughs> that's why i have a love-hate relationship with it it's like okay i get the story i understand why my teens love it but it's just like it's one of those, like, you have to bite your tongue. And I was like, I'll wait until they're raised so we can have this conversation. But Claudia was my exposure. And then also with Bleach, um, Yoruchi Shunwen was another exposure. Just seeing her similar. And I also dyed my hair that shade of purple because I was, like, such a fan of hers. And she turns into a cat. So I was like, that's another love and exposure. <laughs> Would anyone like to add on anything else to what any of the other previous speakers have said? Yeah, I like that we're all kind of finding the bits that fit and discarding the bits that don't. And, you know, as we're finding our representation going along on on that journey, because nothing's ever going to be exactly perfect representation, I don't think, outside of like autobiography. And I don't know if that counts necessarily. But like learning that discernment of like what's good for you and what's not good for you is definitely part of like maturing and reading, I think. Mm -hmm. I think you make a fair point. And I just wanted to add like something similar that I kind of followed in terms of like what David said, where I know that I'm not going to have a direct representation of like, I'm Bangladeshi, so I'm I'm not going to have that character. So I look wider to South Asian characters in manga and anime. And when I don't get that, I'm like, anyone who just comes close to my skin tone or darker, you know what, I'm going to just, this is where I'm going to put all my hopes and dreams on. I'm just going to root for this person and make all the apologies and excuses for whatever they do in this story. (laughs) So that's where I'm going from. Yeah, I already adopted Phil from The Promised Neverland, so I'm like, he's mine. (laughs) Growing up, uh, I started watching anime when I was three, and like, since I look like my mom too I guess the representation part was always like uh, and like I don't know a little complicated for me because on one side uh yeah like I'm Asian so obviously I just felt represented but then on the other side I just um I was black too and I just noticed like whenever there was a black character I mean it's like this till today we had this discussion the other day um we were like do you guys have any anime characters that are like black women uh they're like I don't know and they were thinking and every single black woman we fought about was like in a fighting game which was kind of weird to be honest like I was like okay but doesn't that kind of sound like fetishization I don't know it's like there's this undertone of fetishization in there and um it was really sad uh and then there's like this broader spectrum too like you know some people are like okay but it's not really uh catered to us Japanese culture but okay but they're they're literally dealing like worldwide by now and uh of course not everyone has to include everything but um 
when you have series like I don't know like Tekken and then that, that are getting anime and then like newer series that literally play around the world like then it's kind of unrealistic to think okay they're just not going to put like brown people in there now because it is kind of weird and you'll uh, remember oh I'm sorry, I'm sorry. oh no go ahead like... it's okay <laughs> I'm sorry um y'all remember school rumble Okay, you know how there was that character Lala Rodriguez, and for a second there I was really excited for some sort of like Latinx representation when I first watched it, and um, it was just kind of disheartening because although she was a Mexican exchange student, they sexualized the character. Yes, she was tan, but portrayed as loud and even dumb. And that's just so disheartening, you know, because you want to see yourself in in this format and then for artists or, you know, storytellers to only include you as a punchline or include someone that looks like you as a punchline sends a very disheartening message. So, and then, you know, you have to realize that a lot of our students or my students, especially my middle school students, they watch this or they read them and something that's important that we do is kind of begin that discussion with them too. Otherwise it's just going to be like this cyclical pattern and they'll take those messages at face value and never dare to question it. So we have those conversations in our clubs sometimes, especially in our book clubs about why they like certain manga and why they like certain anime and the characters and what is it about them that they relate to and if they could have created their own character what would that type of character entail? And it's always, I want to be a hero. I don't always want to be, you know, a villain. I want to be a hero. I want to be able to save someone. I want to be able to to see myself in in the stories, right? And I was like, so, okay, so if you were saying if there was a completely, you know, a manga storyline with 100% 100% Mexican characters, would you read it? Yes, no question, <laughs> you know, because they want to see themselves, they want to see them, their settings, right, their their country, their traditions, their cultures, those norms that we often see down here, and yeah, so anyway, I, I was just wondering if y'all had ever school rumble, anyone, Cesar? <laughs> I think that things like fighting games, battle manga, sports manga, things like that, especially, they kind of, they have a a different kind of representation maybe than like action manga or adventure manga because it's all about competition. So you kind of inherently have people coming in to compete and then leave again. And if you look at the Olympics, normally there's not like one person in the Olympics where we're like, that guy is the quintessential American. You know, it's, this person's representing the country, so it's cool. And I think Tekken can get away with like a cast that's entirely stereotypes because everyone can kind of latch onto a stereotype in a different way, you know? It's not super great, but it's sort of like a stepping stone to getting to like better, fuller representation. Like Eddie Gordo, for instance, in Tekken is a uh, Brazilian capoeirista. And it's not 100% accurate to what he would be like in real life, but everyone I know who does capoeira like knows Eddie Gordo and it's like, oh no, that's our guy. Like we love that guy for better or for worse. Yeah, if I can jump off what, what David had said, I think uh, representation in in sports manga or anime, oftentimes, especially if it ends up being like international uh, sports or anything, um, you get a lot better representation there because it's always, again, they're representing either the country or or uh, there's just a black character or uh, uh, Latinx character on the other team and even if they don't understand each other it's always like for the love of the game no matter what it is it's for the love of the game um, I thought a very interesting representation of um, of Brazil was at the end of Haikyuu uh, I'm sorry if I'm spoiling for anyone but there is a character that visits uh, Brazil I won't even tell you who it is uh, but a lot of the uh, dialogue within it is in Portuguese. And I'm like, that is fantastic. They could have just put it in English and saying like, they're actually speaking por- Portuguese, but no, it is in, in Portuguese and in, in small parentheses, they have the English translation. And I thought that was very interesting. Um, and yeah, it, it's very, I feel like it's very hard in, in Battle Shonen 
uh, one of my favorites is uh, Naruto. And as much as I love Naruto, I know that Killer B is a super dope character, but they just had to make the dark skin character a rapper and everything. And it's like, he beats up Sasuke like no one's business, which I'm sure a lot of people applauded, but it's like, it's also, you're also a stereotype, which is like, you, you it's the, as, as David was saying, like for better or for worse, like you, you take what you can get, uh, but it could be done better. I feel like uh, there's a lot of, a lot of really good black characters now um i know that there was one uh, i haven't finished watching fire force or reading yet but i know there was one in fire force that people like loved and i'm like good i'm glad that we're going in that direction where it's not just a stereotype and we're going to where people feel like they can hold on to that character and say like this is who we are this is who we're putting all our eggs in our, our in that basket and, and yeah thank you everyone for your thoughtful responses to this question. Moving on to question two. How do you sit within your own identity pocket in light of what is pushed as popular or marketable in the industry? I can jump on this one too, break the ice. Uh, it's a nightmare sometimes, but that's just sort of like the story of being not white in America, I think. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about like the stereotypes and the tropes and things that sort of follow us around, no matter our culture or our identity. And you kind of, you know, you take the good, you take the bad, and you kind of make the best you can out of what you get. And what I found is that seeking out stuff like Michiko in Hachin, which was by, uh, written and directed by Sayo Yamamoto, which is really good. And was about, you know, a couple of black women from a Japanese perspective. And also it was like set in kind of fake Brazil, which is another thing, like the soundtrack really hit the spot. So even though it's not one-to-one -to, -one to my experience, there's like this constellation of stuff that's like, like if there was a, a sphere of blackness that, and it's not like an exclusive sphere, but like an inclusive kind of sphere, like Michiko and Hachi would be in there for me because I think it's an interesting angle on something that I know well. And that kind of thing, like finding things like that, I think makes the Mr. Popos and things easier to like ignore because I know there's good out there. Yeah, I just want to back that one too because another one that just became a manga last year and it was a very popular anime was Carol and Tuesday. And that brought a lot more representation and diversity, which I really love seeing because again, it's really hard to see Black women in anime and they're not like these tough sexualized fetishized characters and it's like there's more to that and there's more to us than that and this is someone who really wants to become a musician and just have a better life for herself and, and that's relatable for all of our all of us including teens and kids they want a better life and they want to have that chance so i love seeing stuff like that and also, I love that anime you mentioned is like one of my top 10 favorites. And it's like, yeah, it's like really we could take what we can get and just, especially being a young adult librarian who serves mostly teens of color, we, they love reading the manga, love watching the anime, and they're still looking for, that's my story. You know, it's not, they're not seeing their skin tone or someone who looks like them but it's like I'm still relating to this story so they try to take what they can get and then we try to yeah again we try to ignore the Mr. Popos the sister crones of the promised Neverland that was hard to go through um it's it is literally we we hope for more we know that there's more and especially with the creator of Fire Force I love um phrasing what he said is like he purposely adds people of color in his manga, he's like, we cannot pretend that they don't exist because we do exist. Um, um, oh, go ahead. go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry. You're, no, you're fine. It's like interrupting everyone today. Uh, I just wanted to add to what David said because he mentioned soundtrack and that just kind of uh, brought up a little, a little memory. Um, so I had realized a couple of days ago that the weekend had this animated video, right? For Snow Child. And the animation was by D, D Art 
oh gosh, I don't know how to pronounce the last part of your Pajir. And that is, they're based out of Tokyo and it's the American owned 2D animation studio. And it's, it's amazing because then you have that representation of creators who are not just creating um, any type of content, but popular culture content. And that kind of reach is just so amazing because who doesn't love the weekend, right? Or no, anybody? <laughs> Do we all agree? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, good. I was like, can y'all hang? Okay, awesome. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, I, you said soundtrack and I was like, well, you know, my kids and I were talking about that the other day. Anyway, so Sasada, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to go off what uh, Renee had said about uh, being a young adult librarian myself and uh, the kids of color wanting to see themselves in, uh, in these stories. Uh, but I feel I still have kind of the mindset of when I got into anime, was I didn't see the skin color at first because back then I grew up in a bad neighborhood and I was the nerdy kid, right? I was, when all my friends were outside, uh, I was the one inside and I would be watching anime and everything and I got my friends into it. Um, but there's times where you just feel this unsurmountable loneliness and you see a character in anime and you're like, that's who I wanna be. Because again, a, a lot of the protagonists in shonen animes uh, and manga always end up alone in the beginning and their their one goal is like I want everyone to love me or I want everyone that I love to be happy and you kind of feel that for yourself um and I feel like that's a lot of the things that kids still see um within manga now because I work uh, at a library a public library that's connected to a middle school and they're still looking for that whether it's uh, again when they see themselves people of color in the manga that's just the biggest boost that I could give them but they still love the inclusion that they feel of seeing their own story or what they want to be their own story uh because even though they're going through very hard stuff they can feel like things will get better right look at what all these characters went through but things will get better and you don't just see it in in um like uh shown in uh battle uh manga or anime you see it a lot and again a lot of slice of life that are very very sad um and you you hope and you you see and you watch and you see these characters grow and reach that the good part and you they they reach their their happy conclusion characters want to see that or, or students want to see that um but it, when they see themselves in it as well it's just the the best thing that they can can find i love that you mentioned that so cuz i i teach middle school i teach grades 6 through 8 and the intense emotions that my middle schoolers have is unlike anything I've ever seen, right? And sometimes you have to remember, oh yeah, I was 12, 13, 14 before. I don't know if I remember feeling that intensely, but I think now, especially since we're in this endemic, it's harder for at least my students, I feel, to try to verbalize what it is that they're feeling and what it is that they want to express. And while they're trying to find that in the literature that I try very hard to provide, their feelings of loneliness are sometimes overcome by that camaraderie that they develop with fellow readers. A lot of my students are um, very limited with their English. The majority of my students come from Mexico, Central America, South America. And um, in Mexico, manga is very, very popular. So when they come over here, oh, I love seeing the expression on their faces when they see DBZ or, you know, whatever other popular titles that they love because they've seen the, the anime in, in, in Spanish and then they've read some of the manga in Spanish, which is really hard to come by, by the way. Oh, just going to throw that out there. But the, the social connections that they make with, with the students who are uh, native to the valley and finding that connection with each other. And I love seeing that because it all takes place in the library. And I feel like oh, mission accomplished, we did our job, everybody, great job, <laughs> you know? So I love that manga can bring our kids together like that and help them overcome those feelings of isolation, especially at such a fragile, fragile time, right? We have to consider not just the literature, but also where they are developmentally and what we can provide to them that can be, relevant to their experiences so that they know that they're cared for and that they know that we see them. 
Yeah, I want to continue on that too, because it's really similar with my teens, because mental wellness was a was deeply impacted during this time. And especially with communities of color, they were they were impacted the hardest, their, their stats. And with my teens, they found themselves drawn, especially myself from experience, with the social anxiety, not feeling like feeling isolated alone. And that's how Comey Can't Communicate has become like the top title of our library because they related to this girl who was Frozen Renee strikes again. <laughs> I can build on her point while we wait for her to come back. Sure. Thanks, David. <laughs> yeah. A great example of what we're all talking about is Saint Seiya, the manga and anime property, which is huge in Mexico and Central America. It's less popular here. But even though it's not direct representation like we've been talking about, there's something there that kids for generations have latched onto, you know. So if you can kind of talk to the teens and figure out what's clicking there, then there's kind of an angle to figure out like where to push them to find the representation that they need. And it looks like Renee is back, so. <laughs> Renee, are you there? I'm here and this my Wi-Fi is absolutely awful. I'm sorry. It's all good, go for it. Yeah, but it's the same thing with like Comey Can't Communicate with all the mental wellness Pickles is agreeing with me, that's my cat. Um, it, it was just, it's not just with their identity, it's just like the escapism that they need too. And that's what manga and anime is just so wonderful about because it's like, okay, we're stuck. We're stuck in isolation. We can't go anywhere, but through this, we can go someplace else. Wonderfully put, absolutely agree. And just to like round out what Caesar said, I think it is so important for BIPOC um, patrons to have a full range of accessibility of what kind of stories they want to see, whether it's slice their life or shonen or something else. That's that's important, like having that variety for them. Agreed on all accounts. So next question. It is important that representation be a spectrum so that we avoid creating new stereotypes or playing deeply into respectability politics. What are your thoughts on inclusivity and villains we love, even if we hate them? This was mine, I think. Um, I have a vested interest in this question because I love rap music and my favorite genre is crime. So it's like, I, I need bad guys in my life, so to speak. And there was a book last year, maybe the year before called Blacktop Wasteland. It, it was a prose novel, but it was about a black getaway driver in the South. And I'm from the South, I've driven a car and I'm black. So I was like, yo, this is right up my alley. And it was refreshing to read a story about someone kind of similar to myself in that same way. And I hope with manga and anime, like for people younger than me, for kids, for adults, to find people like that as well, to, who, if you like messy stories, like if you like like Jose manga, if you like crime stories, it's important like you get your inclusivity in as well, I think. I can go next. Um, I, I think, being uh, a villain in anime and manga and when you're only ever the villain and it's it just feels flat where you're like I, it has no character behind it has no reason uh, I think one of my favorite villains in recent movies or anything will always be Eric Killmonger from Black Panther because he had a reason and he had um, like again you can you can watch that movie and think wow he's bad but you can't really say he was wrong because he he was doing everything for the black community um, but the villains that I, I, I love to hate and everything, I, again, coming back to Bleach, because Bleach, again, uses a lot of uh, Spanish in uh, their, their anime and manga, the Hueco Mundo arc, uh, you get the Espadas, um, which are some really just cool villains. Um, and just, again, it, it, even if the, the characters are not of uh, Latin descent, it's still using a language that, a lot of uh, Latin uh, countries use, which is which is Spanish, um, and it's just very interesting to see. So that's some of them. I'm trying to think of other characters, but I'll let someone else uh, talk about characters that they love to hate or hate to love. I'm just gonna quickly jump in and mention 
um, a character that like I have talked to with like Caesar and Jillian before, like at our meeting, and that's Scar from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Because initially, for like the first half of the show, when they didn't reveal like the twist at the end, I generally thought like they were being portrayed as the villain. That made me so upset that this one character who's close to my skin tone has this role in the story, and it was disheartening until the twist came at the later when um, the author showed that they're actually an oppressed like group of people. And I think that was very skillfully and cleverly done to show that like characters like Scar can be gray and can be BIPOC as well. So that has always had like a special place in my heart. Um, so with me, um, I haven't really seen anime where I've seen like villains from like, oh, they look like me or uh, wow. Uh, I feel represented by this, but uh, of course I've seen villains where I thought, wow, I can actually understand the motive to a point where I'm like, oh, I hate this person, but uh, I also hate that I can really relate to them. But um, I'm, also, I'm actually at the spectrum where I'm like, uh, I actually like villains that aren't always relatable. Uh, like, you know, Caesar said, like, he likes when they're not really flat or when they have a purpose sometimes. I think it's cool if villains are just evil to be evil. And um, even if they look like me, I think I would still find it cool just because like writing a good villain is really hard. And I think uh, I would feel really honored if we got a black villain like in an anime or manga where I go, oh my God, this dude is sick. Like, um, I'm actually like, you know, I'm writing the next chapter and actually like uh, one of the villains I wanted to introduce is black. And now I'm kind of stuck between this, um, what do I do now with this? Because it's a really sensitive topic because um, if there's villains like us, uh, do we just go and include them like everybody else? Like, okay, they just have a motive like everyone else or do we include some of the things we actually get, uh, went through like in Black Panther, you know, like uh, Killmonger was doing all of this because of how the black community has been treated and suffered in America. And then now if every black villain had a background like this, I guess we'd be at the point like, isn't this a little too stereotypical? Like, is this all we want to make of ourselves? Like, ooh, I'm a hurt black person like of course it's important but like do we want every single black character we put somewhere to grow up in a bad neighborhood and to go through the struggle like do we have to put this trauma and struggle into every character we write that that's the problem I've been having it's like I've been thinking of something and I've been really in this road like uh do I make it about their skin color or do I just make them a villain that happens to have that skin color? And I think I would like to see like the like later one, like more represented because I don't know, I think uh, it's important to have both. Like, of course, yeah, uh, it makes total sense that a lot of people like, in our groups like become evil because you know of the things they've gone through but do we really want to make all of that our single identity in every medium we're represented in yes it raises a great question and i would like for another panelist if they would like to chime in on this i'm just gonna hope that my wi-fi does not freeze again <laughs> um but that's how i i totally relate with that and that's why I had so many issues with the promise Neverland because Crumb was sympathetic. She wanted to be a good mother. She, I mean, she wanted to defeat Isabella, but she felt second best and she was always second best. And like, we all relate to that. So. Hello, I think Renee is frozen. again. Okay. We love you, Renee. <laughs> if I can, if I can just uh, chime in after what Yase had said about, uh, uh, I, I I love villains as well because sometimes again you love to hate them, you hate to love them. Um, I, I do like when characters do have a very good complex story where you're like, ah, I can kind of see it. But also, yeah, I, I think writing a character who just wants to be the strongest, right? Who just like again, you get people like in Baki Hanma who like his dad is like, I just want to be the strongest ever and kick the crap out of everyone and that's what I'm gonna do and 
that that pushes Baki to be like, well, now I want to beat my dad, and that's his purpose. But there's characters that are just like the singular thing of like, I want to be the strongest, or I want to be the richest, and everything. And I think that's completely fine. I mean, there's, uh, like you said, you don't want to stereotype uh, people by being by having everyone follow the same um, goal of like, oh, well, I'm doing this because my people are oppressed or anything, or my people have been treated badly. It's okay that people just again there, there's there's good and bad people in every race ethnicity nationality and everything and i think that's that's fine to portray them like that to say hey this guy's a jerk just because he's a jerk right he he likes to kick puppies which is not good so you should hate him like that's that's fine and then yeah go for it I, I, i'm excited to see what you write about that thank you very much and so my the final question for me will be Japan is a very homogenous society, and manga often refers to comics that originate and are published in Japan and that are created by Japanese mangaka for the people of Japan. With that said, do you think BIPOC representation should increase in manga? Do you think BIPOC artists and authors can break into the forefront of the manga industry? If so, why and or how? Um, if I can start this one off, uh, I think this is one of the main reasons why me and Reedy wanted to do this panel was because again we're both by Punk, uh, and we talked about like we want to see more representation um, in manga and anime, and we, we we talked about how Japan is very homogenous, so it's very it's, it's, it's as the question asks it says uh, if it's not made in Japan or not made uh, by um, somebody who is Japanese, it's not accepted. Um, and it really begs the the question of does moving there and and because again there is a lot of uh, manga studios or anime studios now who are who are not Japanese um, who are now moving there and producing this stuff is that good enough for them or will they then add on another hurdle of like well you're actually not Japanese and it begs the question again of what happens when someone's mixed right if, if they're Black and Japanese, and is it going to be the struggle that a lot of mixed people feel, or mixed people or uh, immigrant people feel of like, I'm not enough for this side, and nor am I enough for the other side. So I'd really love to see at least Japan open up a tad bit um, and accept it, because again, it's. I think we can get so many beautiful stories from uh, them accepting that, and so many people have great stories to tell. So. Yeah. And at the same time, we have to be willing to redefine what manga is and what qualifies as manga because it's like having movies or other types of books, right? And obviously they're written in different languages and they're catered to different demographics. And I just think a lot of this question just kind of lends itself to say that there has to be that willingness for that dissection of the active role of gender and race and in the deconstruction and the reconstruction of symbols and meaning associated with heteronormative or singular race representation. Otherwise, I don't think we'll make any real progress in that sense. And um, I, would, I would love to see myself born manga, you know, and not necessarily always a big, strong male either, you know, where's the short chick? <laughs> where's the short fat chick, man? You know, I, I want to know, I want to know where she is and just have to be willing to be able to bend the rules a little bit. And unfortunately, unfortunately, that's going to come with a lot of backlash, I'm sure, but people have to be willing to be flexible. Otherwise, we're just dismissing a whole bunch of identities and that's not fun or nice. There's a saying that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. And I think that goes for creators in any industry and in any media. Well, I think there's two parts to this question though, because a creator working in Japan, would they be working for a Japanese audience and increasing the kind of inclusivity for the market over there? Or would it be for the benefit of people over here? Because one's kind of like a licensing question and the other is kind of like a publishing question. And I don't have a good answer to the question like to either one, I think. 
But I do know that over here, you know, editors can seek out the people who grew up on manga and anime who kind of internalize all that storytelling the same way, you know, people internalize like Jack Kirby and X-Men comics back in the day and push them to the forefront because the stories are going to come from like the kids that you all are teaching and serving at your libraries. I think more than anyone else, people who grew up like kind of in this soil. So it'll be interesting to see how it turns out, but I don't know if I have a take on how it will be yet necessarily. Uh, if I may say something as a mixed person, like being half Asian and half black, um, I think what Dar Star Geo did was pretty good. Like they didn't say, okay, like we are mangaka, whatever. They moved to Japan because I think uh, to answer your question, you know, you were like, would it be better to do it over there, to influence it there? I think actually it would because, you know, it's the main source and Japanese people, <laughs> like from my experience and from my family too, uh, there is still this xenophobia and um, the stereotype, like the stereotypes uh, we talked about even before. So I think it's really best to just like grab the problem at its root, which is, well, you know, over in Asia where all this stuff first came to be. And I really think uh, we could like, obviously we can't just take it away. Like it's, it's, you know, our culture, like people, but we could work together and involve ourselves more. They're like Dar Stagio did, like, you know, um, there's a whole black man and he owns that studio and he went and opened it in Tokyo. And now he's working with black and American and Japanese people for that sake. So I think, uh, I think that would be a good start. Um, I mm -hmm. think it would work pretty well. He also brings up a great point. Would any other speaker like to add on to that before we move on to Jillian's question? Going once, going twice. Jillian, over to you. So, um, thanks really for guiding our panelists through those questions. And since this is a, a webinar series about manga in libraries, I do have two specific questions about library communities. So the first question is, in regards to manga and anime and the fandoms around these communities, how can librarians support a sense of belonging and celebrate identity in their libraries? Visibility and making sure that we create a very inclusive collection, not, I mean, very inclusive library program through the collection, through the resources, through the programs that reflect and celebrate multiple identities. So for example, at the moment, my gaming club encompasses a lot of things, not just video gaming, but tabletop, manga, and anime, anime aficionados, right? Because it gives a place for my kids to congregate where maybe they wouldn't otherwise do so. Because those kids that I have, they don't, I know that sometimes they feel that they don't always fit in somewhere, right? Maybe they're not the most, mm, I don't know, greatest at the you know academic achievement thing maybe they're not the ones in the top 10 but and maybe they're not the students who would normally visit the library but because of that opportunity they now associate the library with things that they like and people that they've formed relationships with and friendships with and um i think what it all boils down to is just providing opportunities for them and being self-reflective in your own practice I often get the question, you know, what manga do you suggest for the students? I get this a lot from other librarians who work in middle schools. And I say, well, honestly, <laughs> you have to be willing to do the work. You have to be willing to read multiple titles. I, what I think my what I think my kids like is based on the conversations that I have with them and the things that I've read and the things that I feel are cool to book talk with them, but because I know my students. I don't necessarily know that that is going to fly in your school or, you know, I don't know your students, but you do. So you have to be willing to set aside some time to review and read and review and reflect and, you know, decide because there's been multiple instances where they add books to the collection and they have to, unfortunately, remove them due to not being age appropriate. And, you know, I don't want to say, well, yeah, I could have told you that, but at the same time, you have to read it for yourself, you know, sometimes I, there's things for the high school that I probably wouldn't add to the middle school or vice versa, you know, and um, 
especially in middle school titles that I probably wouldn't add to the elementary. So it just, it just depends. But if anything, I feel if librarians can do anything to support a sense of belonging is to do the work as hard as it might be, <laughs> but be willing to have those conversations and not be completely shut out to the idea of adding these types of titles, whether you're a manga reader or not. Yeah, uh, if I can jump off what Karina said, uh, I think doing the work is one of the biggest parts for uh, at, le at least cre curating a manga collection and kind of making it a, a sort of inclusivity because uh, ma manga and graphic novels are both seen as not real reading, which they are. Again, they, don't, they, they, they very much are. Graphic novels sometimes have that uh, bad rap of like, well, they're very confusing because there's so many runs of different things and manga is very easy it's one two three four it's it's sequential it, it, you, you just follow the story and you're good to go um and having the anime clubs uh where kids can just be kids and, and be themselves and not have that fear of like oh well i can't talk about manga and anime at school because i get made fun of guess what there's other people here who like the same things the same things i do and yes uh karina i think that's one of the biggest hardest things for uh, any library creation, a curation of uh, of mangas that read it, you have to read it, you have to know what you're talking about, and even if you don't, again, if, if the librarian does not enjoy manga, that's fine, but there are titles that uh, tend to, again, it can be a, a normal title, and it could then jump to something where it is not very age-appropriate, so you have to know whether that title is okay or not, um, and I think, again, for, for myself as a manga and anime lover, uh, I always kind of say, you have to be willing to open up to these kids a bit and show them like, hey, I'm a librarian. Yes, I'm an adult, but I'm also like you. I read this stuff as well. I love this stuff. And the sheer amount of gasps that you're, you'll hear of like, what, like you read this too? I'm like, this is where most of my paycheck goes to kids. Like it's a, it's a bad habit, but I love it. Um, and that opens up the the uh the world of oh so he's not that different than I am and then now you have that closer connection the better rapport with the students yeah I'm just gonna jump in and I'm on my phone and I apologize for all the freezing um I totally agree with everyone else said and also it makes me think of like what about like how other people have gained such inspiration from manga and anime. We have people creating their own works. You got webtoons who are heavily influenced. We have American shows that are heavily influenced by this. I actually picked up a book by um, this. This is by a Nigerian American woman named um, Jackie I. I hope I said her name correctly. And she runs a website and her own web series called Adorned by Chi. And these are all women of color who turn into magical girls and they solve life issues and it's so wonderful. And our library just recently picked up this book and it's called The Magical Girl's Guide to Life. She wrote this book as a self-help book using magical girls and anime to make it so much, it's like this is one way to connect to our teens and connect to just the community and it's like, if there, it's like, of course, I, I grew up as well being like the loner and the outsider who loved and because when it came out, everyone was afraid. It's usually everyone's afraid of something that's new. But now that it's gained popularity and mainstream, it's like, it's the same thing as um, Caesar said. It's like, I like this too. And it makes you relatable to others. And you can find a relatable like fan base that you can like find that camaraderie that you wanted so much. Anybody else want to share? Okay. Not me. I'm a library patron. I don't know anything about running them. <laughs> for, for, especially for the people who, who are manga fans and everything. And uh, again, I know Karina said that uh, uh, she works with young kids as well. Uh, be ready because these kids will test you. Uh, I just had an outreach program and this kid's all like, oh, you're wearing a Naruto sweater? Name five characters that aren't Naruto, Sasuke, or Sakura. And I'm like, boom, here you go. He's like, Pff. all right. So they will they will test your your weaveness and your otaku-ness. So be ready to 
to fight for your cred. Defend your cred. I have passed the test, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I know Wait, something that. Oh, sorry, sorry. Renee. That I have to say that too because one of my classes who I love so much, they actually have a printout picture of me in my Hatsune Miku cosplay. And it's written our favorite librarian. So once you know your stuff, you're a rock star to them. And you can't ask for anything more than that. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Not to mention that they end up trusting your suggestions afterwards, right? It's like, oh, this is good. If you like this, then th you'll like this. Oh my gosh, okay, next thing you know, they've read the entire series after, you know, they'll just, it, it's, it's so nice to see them, you know, to become those readers because they trust you. I think one, one thing that the students really appreciate in the library, I have a section of the library, it's two walls now, it's grown over the eight years that I've been there. And I call it Artist Alley, you know, but students are drawing all the time in class, in the library, wherever, or they're drawing at home and they're bringing in artwork just to be hung up in Artist Alley. So now it's just like, it's slowly just spreading across the, the, the walls, the student artwork. And then as they're growing up, because we're a sixth through 12th grade school, they can still see the artwork they made when they're younger. And I think that brings a little bit of like ownership of the space as well. And some of these characters are from anime and manga. Some of them are created using the style. So I think that's a special way to, to just let students celebrate themselves on the space. But our last question, something we love to do at the end of every webinar is to get some book recommendations or suggestions for resources. So my question for you, uh, what manga titles do you suggest that have positive representations of BIPOC characters? And also, what resources do you suggest for librarians to use to identify these titles for collection development? Well, I came across, I don't know if any of y'all are BuzzFeed readers, but sometimes I get sucked into <laughs> rabbit hole posts and there was this one article that I came across I don't know a few weeks ago and it was about 50 BIPOC anime characters who deserve their own series and maybe it, it would be a good way to kind of um, begin that discussion about more representation is by giving these minor characters <laughs> major roles in their own stories. For example, uh, oh, what's her name? Is it Lenora? Or from the gym leader from Pokemon, right? She's an archeologist or something like that. Um, and uh, just different characters that I think could really, because then it kind of brings up the idea of, okay, well, are, are a lot of my students know about these characters. Now, what if that those characters who had this minor representation now have a major role in their own storyline. I feel like that would be kind of cool to see. Uh, it's kind of cheating to name like a subgenre, but sports manga, I think is pretty reliable for various types of inclusivity. There's always a risk of running into stereotypes, you know, just because it's, it's sports. Um, but for the ones like Haikyuu or Slam Dunk that are kind of about the love of the game, it tends to be like they were saying earlier about the competition, about finding a way to connect with someone you have nothing in common with other than your shared love of this very specific thing and like wanting to beat, you know, the person above you on the ladder. So I think there's a very easy kind of relatable like representation to be found in sports manga. So I can piggyback off that. I think sports manga, again, is very reliable um, as well for representation. And it's always, it, is, it always is about the love of the game um, and a lot of them. And there's something for everyone, right? Oh, you like sumo wrestling? There's Matsuno Zumo. Uh, football, there's Ice Shield 21. Tennis, there's Prince of Tennis. There's something for everyone of any uh, sports background. So you can find something uh, for the question about resources to give to other librarians or anything. Uh, there is a website called Anime News Network that if you go to, it'll give you all the updates on what's happening in the anime or manga sphere. Um, but they have like an encyclopedia section where you can look up uh, titles and it usually tells you how many volumes there is. It'll give you a bit kind of like the, the genres or the sub, subplots in it. Um, from there, you can just kind of see like, well, is this something that I want to get? 
uh, that you might have to do a bit more diving and maybe even read synopsis just to make sure that it, it is um, okay for students of certain levels. That's a really good one. Um, all my other tips about are about manga buying. So <laughs> those, those are all the other websites I can think of. But uh, Anime News Network is a good one um, when it comes to just trying to find the the name of the manga and a good jumping off point of uh, researching it. Yeah, there's also um, CBR.com. They not just comic books, they also do anime and manga reviews and a list of like anything under um, anime. They did um, BIPOC characters, um, relatable characters. I was actually looking at this before I jumped in on the webinar and there's Manga Plus. Um, I remember not too long ago, even going through like Kodansha, Viz, all the publishers, um, they have reading guidelines and resources that they offer. Um, I ended up using one for Comey for, to like do an anime program. So yeah, there's lots of, um, yeah, again, Anime News Network, there's a lot of resources. Uh, I would like to recommend HBCU Anime. Um, it's like a, a big account on Twitter. Um, they talk about anything anime and manga. They point out a lot of things that are like maybe under the radar, things that aren't that popular, things that are very popular. Um, it's really a space full of like POC and Black people. It's pretty cool. Um, then of course, anime, yeah, News Network, that too. It's really great. And um, I would also check out, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the name. Um, it's another big anime. Oh yeah, uh, Black Girls Anime, exactly. Uh, they do the same thing. Um, there is an artist on there. Her name is uh, Bai Vigalia. She's on Twitter and uh, she made these beautiful brushes for uh, studio paint and so forth, like to draw black like hair in manga and stuff. And she made this book, like this coloring book full of only black, like, anime characters the color it's really great so black girls anime is another like page slash podcast i would check out they really have a lot i found a lot of things i never heard of there and uh, it's all genres really you find everything from sh typical shonen to slice of life to even psychology so i would recommend that Thank you so much, everybody. And we'll try to put a list together. Uh, so when you see at the bottom of the webinar, there will be a link to resources and books that we suggest. But unfortunately, we are out of time for tonight. So we're going to close. Uh, so thank you for all the experts for participating in this discussion about BIPOC representation in manga. And I just wanted to note something fun. It is the one year anniversary of Manga in Libraries. It was founded last April. So I want to thank all of the previous panelists as well, and anybody that has come to a live stream or watched a video on YouTube. The series would not have been able to continue without your support. So if you want to catch up on any of the previous webinars, you can go to the website mangainlibraries.com. Our next webinar in June is Manga in Libraries Teaching with Manga, featuring more special guests, and registration information will be available soon. Thank you so much for supporting Manga in Libraries. And have a good night.